Hi, I'm Russ Segner. We put this series together to feature narrow gauge layouts, seldom seen because they are not located in cities where we normally visit for national narrow gauge conventions. Thanks to the organizing committee of Jerry Cornwell, Pete Smith, Mark Lachey, Dave Adams, and Jeff Schultz. Information in this program is available at NNG at groups Dot io. We hope you will join us. So now for our program. I'll be happy to introduce Craig Symington. So Craig discovered he was interested in trains sometime between the ages of two and three, but he became seriously interested in model railroading after discovering a copy of Model Railroader magazine when he was 15. As it turns out that Malcolm Furlow was running a series in model railroaders on the San Juan Central, and that's kind of what flipped Craig from standard gauge to narrow gauge. And in fact, his first HON3 railroad was a copy of the San Juan Central. His discovery of the narrow gauge and short line gazette in 1989, though, sealed his fate on narrow gauge and prototype narrow gauge modeling. And since then, his wonderful RGS layout in HON3 has, has been a work in progress for 24 years. That work probably could have proceeded a little faster, except for his interests in modeling Canadian National, Canadian Pacific, and HO scale, fishing, boating, camping, and just about anything else outdoors. He used the MNRA Achievement Program to improve his modeling skills, which resulted in him being Master Model Railroader number 553. Craig works to promote the hobby and help others enjoy it, hence he's on here tonight. He was part of the committee that brought us the National Narrow Gauge Convention number 38 in the Twin Cities in 2018. And he's sort of the heart of the local Thunder Bay, Ontario operating group. And he's a prolific author. Craig's first article was published in the Gazette in January of 2008 on the topic of detailing the Blackstone K27. He had articles in the 2009 and 2010 HON3 annual followed by two more articles in the Gazette in 2013. However, in November 2013, he kind of really turned on the jets, and he's had an article in every issue since then. After the 27 articles, Bob Brown named him as a regular columnist on the Gazette masthead in uh, May of 2018. I'm pretty sure that Craig's good friend Jim Vale is smiling down from heaven on this. Since then, Craig's kept up the bi-monthly pace of his column in the Gazette for all of us to enjoy. So I think if you uh, plan on writing an article for the Gazette, uh, there's probably no one really better to listen to than, than Craig. Craig, uh, you've got it from here. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, everyone, for uh, inviting me to be here. Anyway, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, writing for the Narrow Gauge and Short Line Gazette. Uh, as Dave said, I've written for a couple other magazines, but we'll just kind of focus on the Gazette. Dave gave me a pretty good introduction, just something we didn't mentioned I'm into uh, prototype modeling too. I got myself in, involved in a uh, CNR van 78175 and led up the restoration of that and pretty active in the local historical community. If, if you ever end up in Thunder Bay, Ontario, you want to see our, our van or caboose, give me a call or see a couple layouts. About this presentation here, uh, we're going to talk about my uh, motivation for writing, content, photos, keeping organized, copyright and ethics, submissions, rewards, and hopefully inspire new authors. So by doing this presentation, maybe I'll inspire some of you to, to bring out your inner author and, and submit something to one of the trade magazines. Just kind of getting back to where it all began. So I was a teenager in the 1990s. I was reading Model Railroad Magazine and later on into the Gazette. And I used to see articles from Malcolm Furlow, George Salios, Jack Burgess, uh, and then later Harry Brunk and Jimmy Vale, Jim Vale. And I, I used to think, man, these guys are amazing. They were just, you know, kind of icons of the hobby. And it was, I was so impressed that they were writing these amazing articles and it was really inspiring. And I thought, you know, maybe just, maybe someday I might get an, an article published. I, I, I just never imagined it would happen, but that was kind of a goal of mine. And eventually in 2008, I had my first article published and kind of been writing a lot ever since. And one thing that I kind of, you know, I'm up to somewhere around 50 articles or so. And thinking back to those earlier years, I, you know, I was looking up to these authors and I thought, you know, wow, how amazing, but those guys were just amazing modelers. But as far as writing authors, it, you know, it's something that anybody can do. There was nothing special about these guys writing these articles or myself. It's just the fact that uh, these people just decided to do it. And it's something they enjoyed as part of the hobby. So 
I'm hoping that as we go through this presentation, if you have an interest like I did, maybe you'll be inspired to do this because you know anybody here that's listening is uh, certainly capable of doing this. If you ever ask Bob Brown what, what kind of articles he's looking for, his standard answer is we just leave it up to the authors to uh, pick the content of, of their articles. So incredibly unhelpful answer because it doesn't tell you anything, but it, it also tells you lots of things. Basically what Bob is saying is, you know, he's, he's interested in pretty much anything. He doesn't want to have a, a rigid set of criteria for articles. So if you think you might have something that's, that would interest your fellow modelers, you know, send it into Bob. I've worked with Bob for quite a few years here, and these are little tidbits of advice that he's given me. One of the things he says is he said, told me, actually, says, I get a lot of articles in that people just, you know, write about stuff, but they never put an introduction to their, their articles or conclusions. So if you submit something to him, you know, he expects you to have a first paragraph or two introducing what the whole article is about and then get into it. And then another paragraph at the end is the conclusion. So, you know, you got to use proper writing style. He finds that a little bit challenging because he has to send things back to the authors to be corrected. One thing that Bob kind of beats into me is, you know, I do a lot of project articles and he always reminds me, he says, make sure it's reproducible. So don't, don't use a whole bunch of oddball parts. I'm, I'm kind of guilty of still doing that. Keep in mind, if you're doing a project article or something, it really is helpful to other modelers to use parts that they can get. Always important to respect the advertisers. Don't say, you know, XYZ companies, products no good, use this one, it's, that's just not cool. One of the things that's really good is to show the ugliness. And, and what I mean about this is, if you submit an article to Bob on your on your layout, and you have put all these great macro photographs in, like Mike had in, in his presentation, he'll ask you to send a, a picture of the room. You know, he, he says that his readers, when they see those macro pictures that look, look amazing, it intimidates the, the readers into think, thinking they just can't accomplish that. But so he likes to have a picture of the room that shows, you know, the junk underneath the bench work and, you know, all that kind of stuff and show the ugliness of the room and show that there's more to it than these macro pictures. And if you're doing a project article, you know, talking about mistakes are good. You'll see in some of my articles, if I spent some time on something and it didn't work out, you know, I may mention it in there just to save the, the reader the time of making the same mistake. But of course, you don't want to have a whole article that just talks about how you screwed things up. And one thing that really ticks Bob off is if you send him a submission, say a Word document, and you got the pictures all interlaced in with the text, that, that's one way to tick them off. And uh, so don't do that. Also working from Bob, and this was some advice that Jim Vale gave me originally is, you know, just keep it simple. You make it easy for Bob. So when I send him text, you know, I've proofread it quite a few times and try to get rid of all the spelling mistakes and grammatical errors and things like that. So, you know, he doesn't have time to do all that. Uh, it used to be uh, him and, and his wife, Irene, that used to do all the editing. And now it's just him and he doesn't have time to fix, fix your mistakes. He'll, he'll obviously edit it and do what he needs to do, but he doesn't want to do a lot of that. And same for the photographs is when you send your pictures in, don't expect Sharon, uh, the graphics person to Photoshop them up and do th things for you. They got to be pretty much ready to go. And in fact, I don't know if I've ever noticed or any that she's ever changed any of my pictures. And I think she just crops them and that's about it. Another thing is don't give them options. Don't say, well, you could use this picture or this picture. One of the things that Bob said to me is maybe some of the other magazines will maybe send you a proof back to see before it gets published. He, he just doesn't have time for that as a one man show. So you won't get it, probably won't get a, a proof back to uh, to check over and, and okay. And you know, I put a couple pictures up here of some articles I sent to Bob. One on the left is one I sent early on. I gave him like a hundred pictures. You know, you could do this, you could do that. and. You know, that just was not the thing to do. Uh, he sat on that for a year and he had to do a whole bunch of work. And that, in, in hindsight, it wasn't fair to him to do that. I should have done that work. On the right side is generally how I send a picture. It's actually a screenshot of the article I did on the Ofer Depot. I keep it real simple. I always just keep a Word document and a bunch of photographs. And uh, we'll talk about numbers of photographs here. I keep it super simple. This is what I did the early article. Look at all the directories and photo, those are full of photographs. and raw photos and all sorts of stuff. It was, you know, big mistake. <laughs> Don't do that. Uh, this is how I send it now is one word document. And then this one had 12 photographs and that's it. No options, super simple. Length and style. So this is always really hard to figure out. You're putting an article together, how many pages of text and how many photographs, you know, fits a standard length article. And 
most articles, if you check the Gazette, are generally three or four pages. Sometimes uh, he'll give you five or six if it's a, a lengthy article and, and really good content, but usually three or four. And this, this is kind of the guide that I use for myself. There's two different types of articles, a wordy article and a, and a photo article is what I call them. And probably three quarters of mine are the wordy articles where there's lots of text and short captions under the photographs. And, and with a photo article, there's maybe a couple paragraphs and then really long descriptions under the photographs. So when I put my articles together, if I do a wordy article, um, I'll have three to five pages in Microsoft Word at the default fonts and whatever. That's generally works out to a four page article. And, and in those kind of articles, I'll put a, maybe a 12 to 14 photographs and or diagrams into it. And for a photo article, usually it'll be two to five paragraphs. You're going to have to have an introduction conclusion. So there's your two, and then maybe something in between them. And then about two to four more word pages of photo captions and maybe 12 or I've sent up to 20 photos and diagrams with them. On the right side of the page here, just sort of a screenshot of the top and bottom of a typical article that I send into them. I, you'll notice there's virtually no formatting or anything. I just put a bunch of paragraphs together in text because he, you know, he's copying and pasting this. He doesn't want to deal with all that formatting. And I usually end it, and this is what it, I include in the page count, is these are the descriptors for the photo file. So whatever, nine underscore plume across loop JPEG. And there's the caption I sent him for that. So there's short captions for this article. As far as uh, writing tips, you know, you got to pick a tense, past tense is preferred. I built this versus I'm building. I think you'll edit that back to I built. Use simple language. Don't make it really complicated. I, somebody said to me once, write it for a fourth grader. Brief is better. Uh, I've seen some articles that uh, I've helped people with and they'll, they'll go on about the other night I was sitting down watching TV and I decided to add this stirrup step to the corner of the car I was working on while I was watching television. No, just say I've added the stirrup step, you know, keep it simple. You know, so you don't ramble on. And, and I know Bob gets a number of articles where people ramble on quite a bit. So you got to do some concise writing. For me personally, I like to put a lead in photo. I think it's really important. You know, that's more of a stylistic thing. So if you look at all my articles, you'll see there's always a, either a picture of the finished model or the prototype that I'm modeling at the beginning or something to do with the article. And so I try and grab the reader's attention so they see that and go, oh, that looks interesting. And of course, if it's a project thing, I try for a really good shot of the finished model. It's usually that's the lead in article. For myself, as far as my style, like I said, a photo lead, I, I like prototype articles, but like Bob said there, he's interested in anything and everything. So our layout articles, construction articles, history articles, you know, drawings of whatever. For me, I'd like to do the prototype articles. This was the advice that Jim Vale gave me when I started out. And he says, the best thing that you can expect is that some guy looks at the pictures and your article is sitting on the john. You know, that really good advice from Jim and as sarcastic as Jim was. And I think he was actually quoting Bob Brown there. So photos make the article. People flip through the magazine and look at the pictures. And if they don't like the pictures, they're not going to read the article. So it doesn't matter what you do. So it's really good to get some pictures. And it's not that hard to do now. Certainly gotten a lot easier than with digital cameras and smartphones and everything else. Here's a setup I use. It's a real hillbilly setup on my workbench. So you open up a gazette, you're going to see that virtually all the construction pictures were taken like this. This photograph on the right here is what I use. So when I'm working on a project, I take lots and lots and lots of pictures. So if I, I do a step, I add a detail, I, I build something, I move it over to this setup and I take a pic, well, several pictures at different angles and things like that. So this is sort of my workbench studio. It's, you know, some sticks on posts, some reading lamps. Uh, I used to use just regular house light bulbs on here, but these are actually more expensive photo bulbs that are daylight balanced to 5,500 Kelvin. For a backdrop, this is kind of something I learned in the first article with the K27s is I, I experiment with all sorts of different colors. And if you're taking a picture of a model, one thing you do not want is the backdrop to be the same color as any part of that model because it just won't stand out. So I tried different tans and different beiges and white and all sorts of things. And I found out that uh, blue is not a color that we use on our models very often. So I always use blue and I started that with the first couple articles and then Sharon Olson kind of, if you're a repeat offender in the Gazette, she gives you a style and 
the style she gave me from the beginning was blue and brown. Not really something I would have cho chose, but that's what I inherited. And she picked that off these backdrops. So if you're taking pictures, the backdrop color is kind of important. And, and what I got here is actually photo paper, backdrop paper, but I, I just use Bristol board for the most part. And you can just use a sheet of paper or anything. It's sitting on the workbench and it's curled up the backdrop so there's no corners. One of the things that you got to do when you're taking these pictures, just make sure that you don't get a lot of shadows and highlights and shine off things because you, you want to be able to show the details. I've got these lights sort of set up as a sort of studio technique where you have this one here as a fill on the backdrop and then two angled lights here to kind of control the shadows. Most of the pictures I originally took, I had in the center of this picture would have been a right around here would have been an Angela Stellar on a, on a tripod. I don't do that anymore. I just use my uh, my iPhone 10. Uh, I usually have my phone with me anyway. So whenever I get to a different spot along the way, I take a picture with my iPhone and that's it. But you gotta be careful with, if you use a smartphone because they're, they're kind of calibrated and the software is set up to take pictures of people. So it does funny things with your picture. I found on an iPhone 10 with a blue background, if I set it to the color mode to vivid, it gives me the best pictures. So that's what I do. They usually take a 360 degree, degree shots of pic photos. I'm gonna show that in a second. When I first started sending pictures into the magazines, I was really worried about how it had to be, you know, a TIFF file with, you know, high quality image or raw images or however many DPI or whatever. Over the years, it's, it's, it's just evolved down to JPEGs, you know, simple, low quality as far as uh, graphics are concerned image file. Uh, if, you know, has a just a rule of thumb, if the JPEG is somewhere about five megs or give or take, it's probably good enough for the magazine. I don't really know what resolution that is, but that's generally a good guideline. One thing that's really critical is when you're um, putting together an article, for me especially, I'm always under the gun to hit the next gazette or well, two gazettes ahead, is back up the pictures. It would be just devastating for me, especially if, if I lost the first half of the construction pictures for the articles, then I'd just have to start again. So just if you're doing your own stuff, back up your photos as you go along. Otherwise, you may be really sorry. So just a, a shot of this is most of the pictures in this presentation are you'll see in the uh, March, April 21 Gazette here. So this is just an example. What I do is a lot of times when I hit a major milestone like this thing, this model here is just before it's getting painted, I'll do a 360 degree photo shoot of this thing and I'll spin it around and get all the, you know, eight pictures of it. And that just kind of, usually I use one for the article, but one of the things I found is by doing this, and, and I'll do this several times through a project, if I've forgotten to take a picture, say I forgot to take a picture of the, the end sale here or something, because I took these pictures, I can crop in here and, and save my butt and find a picture that I may need. It, it's been helpful to me. Here's taking pictures for that article. This photograph here is set up in my, uh, in my train room. I'm taking a picture of these tank cars are sitting down here at Vance Junction. I use these photo lights. They actually weren't very expensive. The bulbs are probably more expensive than anything. They were 15 US dollars and 30 US dollars, but the, the stands and lights weren't too expensive. I like to use this because it gives me some control over the light. This one on the right is um, a fill light with a diffuser on the front, and this is just a spotlight. And I've got several of each of these, these types of lights that I use. So I use a digital SLR with a remote view shooting. I usually keep my room lights on in the train room. All the bulbs in my room are 5,500 Kelvin with high color reproduction. So it matches the photo bulbs I'm using. This is a fill light here right now. This is spotlight. Sometimes I'll use a couple different spotlights. Sometimes I'll have to take the bulb out of the upper deck here in this case to control the lighting and some of the shadows and, and shine on the layout. But this is generally how it looks there. It gets a little bit crowded. May look a little bit sophisticated, but you know, maybe not necessary. I just find it easier. Jim Vale, if you ever had been to his layout, uh, he had you know, a gorgeous layout, incredibly talented, had horrible lighting in his train room. He had rope lights, he had incandescence, he had fluorescence, he had you name it. And he had a cheap digital point and shoot camera, but somehow he had amazing pictures for years and years and years. So Maybe I'm a little bit overkill, but this this is kind of the setup that I use and it works for me. One neat thing that I ended up buying this thing and I put the name of it is a ProMaster LS6 multifunction light boom stand with ball head camera mount. Anyways, it, it, it's a light boom. You can put a weight on here if you want to stick it out farther. The, the boom will go like six feet and this thing will rise up about six feet. And what I do is I put the digital SLR camera on the end of this thing. You can buy a ball head for a camera and it's, it's for a standard camera mount. 
and you can see a sort of a curly wire here. That's a USB cord. And I didn't really need it for this picture. I'm kind of using it more as a tripod here, but this thing is super handy. You can drop this camera right into a scene and take the most amazing pictures. And I've, I've done that before where it's in a place where I couldn't even physically reach and I'll just knock that camera right down in there. Sometimes it's hanging upside down, the digital image, you just flip it over. And that's, I found really handy. And this is only, I don't know what they cost, maybe a hundred bucks or something. So it's, it, it's pretty neat. I got a couple of them. I've got an old 10, 15 year old Canon. I think it's called an SL1. And with that, you can download this uh, EOS utility for the camera. And basically I have a laptop sitting up on the layout or on a chair or something. And this is what I, on the right hand side here, this is what I'm seeing through the screen. And so I can adjust all the camera settings. The only thing I can adjust is the focus. So I'll manually focus the camera, check it out in here. And through the controls on this right side, I can, I can adjust the f-stop and uh, shutter speed and everything and go full manual. But generally what I do is I, I'll put it on aperture priority. That's, I guess that's a Canon thing. So basically I'll set the aperture to, to give me the maximum focal length and the camera automatically figures out the shutter speed and everything else. So in this scene, I'll, to get your depth of field, focus a third of the way into the picture and the, the back two thirds will, will, will focus out uh, properly for you. And generally with the camera like this, you can get at least two feet of depth of field. And if you need a lot more, then you got to get into software like uh, Helicon Focus and things like that. But I, I keep it pretty simple. Next scene here. So what I do is I, I'll set up the scene. I'll take a ton of pictures. I just put some samples up here, ones I took, some with no additional lighting, just the layout lighting so you can see it's flat. and. This one has too much shine on the tanks. And I think this one, one of these ones I was fiddling with making the back blurry and things like that. But I'll just take pictures. I'll do some bracketing with exposure. Sometimes I'll overexpose, underexpose. That EOS utility will do that for you. I'll fiddle with the lighting, look for a reflection on the, these tank cars were hard to photograph. They kept shining the lights on them. You know, make sure the details of the of what I'm photographing show up. And in the case of these cars that in the article, it's I scratch built these these tank cars. Uh, so I wanted all the details in the frames to show up. So I adjusted the lighting for that. And of course you got to check for focus. Here's the, the picture I ended up with from all that. It turned out okay. This will be the lead in for the next Gazette that comes out and the, the articles on these two tank cars. I could probably do a whole presentation on layout photography and stuff, but I'm, you know, just as a general rule here, we're going to cover a couple of details. So these are there's the rule of thirds where you cut the, the scene in thirds from vertically and horizontally. That makes for a good picture. So I got that here, uh, good lighting. Um, I managed to get the detail of the trucks and the frames that, you know, you can see the details, the articles about that. You know, most importantly, there's, you know, all the wheels are on the rails here, I think, I hope, you know, important things like that. One thing for me is I, I try and keep it simple. I, I'm not very good at Photoshop. So I try and get a pure picture from the beginning. I don't want to tweak with it too much. And so I put a lot of effort into this. And honestly, to get this shot here in the time it took to set up the equipment, it probably spent 20 minutes setting up the equipment and probably 20 or 30 minutes trying to get the picture. So it really didn't take very long. One thing I do after the pictures, even the, the construction photographs is, uh, is I, I will make minor adjustments to the images. On my Mac, there's um, just a couple of automatic settings and I'll use that to sharpen things up and, and brighten things. Uh, if you do a number of articles for the Gazette, you'll find that what you send them may not necessarily be how it prints. For a while there, something happened and my pictures kept turning out in print darker than they show, than I thought they should. So uh, what I do is I actually lighten up in the image is a little bit extra before I send them in, but that's just sort of my, my situation. Keeping organized is very important. So, you know, we're going to get into this, taking lots of notes, organizing your digital files and planning for future projects. It's kind of a joke because this is my workbench looked like when I was doing this article. Not very organized, but it actually is. Really critical. If you're doing a project article, take lots of notes. Uh, what I do is I keep a notepad on my workbench. I actually got several of these stacked up. Every time I do one step in the article, I write it down. And if I have a thought about that step, I write it down. If I use a part, I write down the part number because it's it's a royal pain in the butt trying to figure out what you used afterwards. And, and that's something that's really important to include in a, in a construction article. And what I do is I take this notepad afterwards, and these are just sort of scribbled notes and I'll turn each of these lines into a sentence and I'll group the sentences together and they become paragraphs and I'll group the paragraphs together and they'll become the article. And that's kind of where the articles come from. One of the things I do, like I said at the beginning, uh, 
I organize my files and, you know, you can do whatever you need to do. This is just kind of the way I do it. I keep a clear structure to, to Bob and I kind of talked about this before where I have a text and a bunch of photographs. So this was actually, this is, you know, the next Gazette article here and all the pictures. One of the things I like to do is I number the articles. Bob doesn't like you to put the images in with the text because it makes it hard for him to edit. But as an author, you want to make sure the photos come in the right order. So what I do is I order them by file name so they know what order to put them in. And I try and use something descriptive so it doesn't get messed up. And generally what I do is uh, I take this whole directory structure here and that's what I send to him. And that's what he gets. So it's it, I try and keep it pretty clear to him. You know, I'm always ready more articles and maybe it's something you may be interested in doing is writing a bunch of articles so i kind of i keep a file structure of future articles or potentials and same thing as as i'm if i'm working on another project or have an idea i start throwing in uh, reference material into those directories just in case i might need it one thing is copyright issues obviously when you submit an article to the to the gazette uh, you retain the ownership of the photos and the text but White River owns the formatted version of the magazine. So what that means is, you know, if I send an article in and, you know, that tank car article, for example, and I decided I wanted to use that lead shot of the tank cars at Vance for something else, say I wanted to submit it to, to trackside floors or whatever's in Model Railroader, I could do that legally. Uh, they don't own that picture. I can do whatever I want with it. But when I get that copy of the Gazette and it's all formatted into an article with everything put together, White River owns that. I can't take photocopies or PDF that article and start distributing to people because that breaks the copyright. So got to kind of keep that in mind as you do the article. It's, it's actually pretty, pretty good. I was worried when I started that I would lose control of my photographs. As far as other photographs and diagrams, uh, that that's pretty touchy. Easiest thing and the best thing to do is just, just use your own. Um, if you take the photograph, you own the copyright and you can control it. Outside of that, when you start getting into other people's material, it gets pretty messy. So if there's copyrighted material, you want to use it, you better get the permission. So if you know, I did an article on something and I wanted to, I wanted Mike Blazik's drawings in it, you know, I couldn't just scan them and send them to Bob. I have to go and get Mike's uh, permission and, uh, and work something out with him. So it's kind of easier to do your own, your own stuff if you can. Uh, with old photographs, like uh, stuff that we've seen, you know, the examples up on the screen here, there's three. You know, you kind of get into a whole set of gray area and it's kind of better to be safe than sorry. From what I understand, some of the families are trying to regain the rights to some of the old photographs of their ancestors. So you kind of got to be careful there. And then there's the unknown photographers out there. You know, the photograph like this one I used here as an example, I, I bought a copy of this picture from somewhere along the way and there was no reference to who took the picture or any copyright on it. So who knows? One way to kind of get around some of these kind of gray area pictures is you can um, put in the collection of, um, I've used some photographs from the Swedlers and Dave Grant before um, in their collections. I've gotten sort of gotten around to it. But what I've been doing lately, if you look at, go back to the last probably couple of years of articles, is I've been using a lot of prototype pictures and they, they come from the Friends of the Coombers and Taltic Scenic Collection. They've got the Dorman Collection and others there. And I, I dig into the Dorman Collection there I'll use their pictures and you'll see that they'll get a credit for that. And it costs me or ultimately White River $25 for every picture I use. And I'm paying for the right to use that picture from them. They essentially own the copyright of the digital image. I don't think they really own the copyright of the actual photograph. So it kind of gets into a gray area. For me as the author, you know, I'm kind of passing the buck on to them to work things out with whoever actually owns the copyright of the picture. So that's something I do. And, you know, money goes to a really good cause too. So it's kind of a win-win and it makes the articles better. But Bob's really sticky about this. So you got to make sure you got things sorted out. So uh, ethics, just some things to deal with when you're working with Bob. One thing, conceal the article content until it's after it's published. You know, normally I would never show any of this future article stuff. I kind of gave you guys a little sneak peek of the next article, but that's kind of okay in this case. But normally I wouldn't do that. So if you um, put together a layout article, it'd be not very cool to go and put all the pictures all over the internet before it's been published. You got to give some courtesy to Bob and let him have first shot at it. And don't submit the same article twice. A couple of years ago, there was a really neat layout that got 
submitted to the Gazette and uh, well, at the same time it was in another magazine. That's that's not really cool. And, and respect the, uh, the Gazette advertiser. Bob will remind you of that. They pay a lot to have that magazine put out and, and we as readers benefit from that. So as far as submissions go, uh, Bob's like super old school. He's 88 and he's not going to change. So most of the other places I suspect use an electronic Dropbox or Google Drive or something like that. For Bob, I sent him uh, a burn disk. You got a picture of it right here. It was the last article. I left out the addresses and stuff. But So I mailed that to him. I mean, that's what he gets. Keep the file structure simple. On my end, I'm using a Mac. Bob's got a really old Mac and a really old Windows computer. And so far, he's been able to... Uh, open everything I send to him, but I would recommend not trying to use some sort of strange format, keep it simple and he'll, he'll be able to get it. And obviously you must get a lot of these disks and drives. So I label your media here. So financial rewards, let's talk about this. Basically to do a project or do a project and write about it. Basically it takes about three times to do a project and write about it. And you know, if you look at it, you there's a time for the project, which is a third of that time, time for the notes and photos takes another third. Another third of the time for writing an article. So if the project's going to take you 30 hours to do, budget for 90 hours. So you got a lot of time invested in this. So in the end, uh, I won't say what the author payments are. You can kind of work that out. Typically, uh, at best, what they pay from the magazine will pay for the parts you used in the project. Or if you didn't have to pay for the parts, you might make a dollar or two, or say a loony or a toonie per hour. Actually, those are real dollars. We could say the U.S. dollars. So. Sorry, you, you can't get rich doing this. And money better not be your motivation. And sometimes it even costs you to get published. And I had to clip this lecture down, but it cost me $170 once to do an article for the Gazette. So we'll save that story for another time. So the real rewards uh, is the satisfaction of being published. I can't tell you how exciting that was to see that first article published. And, and I still kind of get excited when I see the next Gazette to see how those photos and the Word document turn into an article is still pretty exciting to see. Also another reward is you're kind of making a contribution to the hobby and you're leaving your mark. Uh, I like to write for the Gazette. I haven't really submitted much to many of the other magazines. The, the reason why I like the Gazette is because probably half of them are still sitting on shelves or in boxes somewhere as people keep them for the reference library. And I think that's pretty cool. So you can be part of that and there's you know, people keep them back 50 years. So that's pretty cool. Maybe the reward is inspiring fellow modelers, but I put a maybe in there because as an author, you have no idea if anybody ever actually reads these or even cares. So hopefully it inspire people to do stuff. And once in a while, you might get a kind comment about an article. And, I'll, and I put the picture up here over on the side here is probably the best compliment any author can get. And I, and I was talking to Mike May about this. He's, he's the same thing. Both of us First place we go to the newest gazette is the pigeonhole. And I, I love it when people write in about the articles. And in this case, was talking about the Ofer Flume article. And if somebody's gonna take the time to um, write to the gazette and even send a picture, you know, you know, you, you kind of made an impact and actually, you know, at least one person read it or, you know, as Jim said, looked at the picture while they're sitting on the john. So, and the last thing is the camaraderie with the other authors. There was a really cool time when it was Steve Harris, myself, and Jim Vale for a couple of years. We had three articles in a row and it was the, the three amigos for a long time. And that was a lot of fun. And now it's Mike May and myself and we're good friends and our articles are together. So that's pretty cool. So that, that's kind of the rewards that you get out of it. That's that's kind of it. I, I thank you for your time. If there's any questions or anything, if you want to get a hold of me later, there's my email address and uh, be happy to help you along. And, and when I prepared for this uh, presentation, I talked to Bob about this just before Christmas. He's, he's anxious for new authors and articles. So if you're thinking about doing something, this would be a really good time and put your idea together. And uh, this presentation are things that I learned and nobody taught me. I kind of had to learn the hard way. So I've given you a, kind of a jump start to what you need to do. So good luck with that. And that's it. Thank you, Craig. <laughs> Outstanding. Uh, Craig, uh, what's the timeline for articles to be published? Uh, is it like a three or four month cycle or more? Or? I got to send one in at least every two months. So I'm kind of different. So I don't know about the regular publications. I sent in uh, by December 1st, December 15th. In that timeline, I was kind of a little late. I sent in the article for the March, April 2021. 20, 
So about two to three months ahead of time. I try and send in many of them at once so I don't have to keep doing it every two months because it's really hard to do. If you send it to him as a non-columnist or non-regular, I'm not really sure, but I, I think the turnaround's pretty quick. My, Mike can actually probably answer that better because he's been sending them in fairly randomly. But I, 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 when I was talking to Bob before Christmas, for me, it's kind of an honor that he, he publishes my stuff. And he says to me, well, I count on you guys on the regular people to send stuff in basically what he's saying is he doesn't have um you know he gets a regular bunch of articles but he really counts on the regular authors and there. there's now um a greg condon and there's all the people that do the drawings there's uh, bob steers and he counts on us to send him regular stuff and i think that's because he doesn't get a lot of other authors writing so i would think if you sent something in that he was interested in it fit in with the other articles he had planned for that particular issue of the magazine you'd probably only be a couple issues out before i even started writing articles i used to hang around with a crowd from milwaukee and they were prolific authors for the model railroader magazine model railroader will buy them well back then i don't know about now but back then they would buy an article and sit on it just to own the article one of those guys had passed away and five more years later they published the article after he was dead <laughs> so that wasn't cool so i like you know, writing for bob um he turns around pretty quick so if you send something in if it fits what he's going to do and it's you know you kind of follow the guidelines i laid out make it easy for him pretty good chance you'll be within the next one, six months of the magazine is what i've seen uh, mike sent in a bunch of articles over the last couple of years as a new author for him and, uh, his stuff was out within two or three issues so I think that's generally the timeline. There was another question in the comments here that David uh, Woodhead had asked. He says, is, is it best to send a letter of proposal before starting an article? I can, really can't speak for Bob, but what I would suggest is if you've got something that fits in with the normal stuff that's in there, you know, layout article or uh, construction article or history article that's narrow gauge or short line related, and you, you kind of follow some of the guidelines I gave you and got some good pictures and it's pretty easy for him. He'll probably publish it if you send it to him. But if you're concerned, that address in the at the masthead of the Gazette, I think it's Gazette at at t or something, email address, he answers that every day. So you could send him an email there. And I'm not sure if there's a phone number in there, but you can ask him ahead of time. He's pretty open to things. He's, he's looking for stuff. And, it, and really, I think his readership is looking for different stuff. They don't want to see same stuff for me over and over again or the other people that you know they're always looking for new stuff like i kind of kind of look at my stuff as you know sometimes there's a really great article i'm super proud of and stands out but he treats the new new authors as you know you get mentioned in the here's what's in the next issue of the magazine if you look at the next issue you'll never see any of my articles in there and i've never been on the cover so he kind of treats these new authors really well and um they're they're at the beginning of the magazine you know at times i you know my stuff is almost filler you know it's just it's always there you know if you have a really neat idea that's different you know he, he'll be all over that and you'll be treated like gold propose the idea to him or send it into him and i think you'll you'll do really well um, the rest of us will be at the last last article in the magazine <laughs> and hold up the hold up the caboose or the van at the end yeah thanks yeah. Anyways, I, I hope somebody got something out of that article stuff. I, I have had a lot of fun over the years putting those together. It's it's pretty cool. And, and you know, Mike kind of came along a couple of years ago and started putting some different articles in there on his uh, signaling and white pass stuff. And, you know, it really kind of makes the magazine so much better. And that, that magazine is, you know, that's kind of the newsletter of all of us narrow gaugers. And, you know, it'd be really nice to see some some new stuff in there. As, as a reader, I'd love to see some new types of articles in there. And, Maybe a little less stuff like mine, like RGS stuff. Let's do something different, and hopefully, if some of you might throw something in at that Bob and get it get it published. Yeah. You know, another hey, thing Craig, Bob says a lot is, Craig, is that you don't need sure. a fancy camera. Craig, do you think they would take another RGS article? <laughs> it seems that that's everybody. Uh, that's oh. what everybody wants to see. So, probably, yeah. No, he's he's not too picky. I, I shoot this down. One of the when I started my layout, I had a really good friend of mine says, so you're building a model of the most over modeled railway in the world, right? You really want to do that is I think what he was saying. And I guess that's where I went. I, you know, everybody likes to see that stuff. So it's there and it's pretty cool to see some different stuff like Mike's and other authors. So Rick, thank you very much. You've inspired me to write an article on the RGS for the Gazette. Well, there's always something that hasn't been done. We hope you enjoyed this. 
We look forward to seeing you again. The next session will be posted on the group's IONNG several days before the next program. Look for the link there.